holy gifts, talents, blessings, and treasures that fill my life to the fullest. My life is a feast that overflows with the delights of your presence. In Thanksgiving, I rejoice in the river of gifts that flows from taste, smell, touch, and sight. May my life be an endless song of gratitude. May this, my life song, be a magnet that draws me ever closer to you, O Divine One, who is whispered in the silent spaces of my heart, words that speak the gift of gifts. You are my beloved. Go ahead and start. <clears throat> All right. Well, thank you. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Sure. Thanks very much. Uh, so yeah, I'm very happy to be here and have this, this opportunity to, uh, to talk with all of you. I'll move this chair back just a bit. I'm typically kind of a quiet speaker, so it's much better if I stand up and stretch the uh, diaphragm out a little. <laughs> More likely to be able to hear me. Uh, now, Will uh, mentioned the, uh, the idea of interdependence toward the end of his remarks. And, um, and it occurred to me uh, on my way over here, you know, I really wanted to say something about Wendell Berry as a fiction writer, which I didn't work into my remarks at all. And so where would I fit that in? And I couldn't find a place. So I'll just say it's beginning, since it's all about interdependence. Um, <clears throat> I became first interested in Wendell Berry as a writer of fiction, uh, starting with some of his short stories. And the one, one interesting characteristic of his uh, short stories, he's got you know, 30 some short stories and nine novels. 
and they're all set in the same small Kentucky farming town. And so <coughs> you, uh, and they, they span over several generations. So you meet some of the same characters over and over again, and you get a deeper sense of who they are, how they're connected to the other people in the community, how those connections extend over the generations. And, uh, and you understand their stories in a much deeper way and the, the things that they've been through. Um, and every time you read another story or novel, you just you feel like these people are more real and that you know them better and that you understand how this community um, <coughs> thrives together and also what problems it's uh, faced over the generations. So uh, in terms of, of understanding human interdependence, uh, his, his fiction is a really very effective way to get a much deeper insight into all the dimensions of that. <clears throat> uh, and I'm gonna be reading you a, a bit of that toward the end. Um, but I was asked to speak on Wendell Berry as a prophet, which is not something I've sort of directly focused my thinking on before much, though I you know, sort of know what it means to think of him as a prophet. So I kind of thought, well, <clears throat> which, where should we start? Should we start with what's a prophet and how does Wendell Berry fit that, or should we start with who is Wendell Berry and what makes him a prophet? Um, and I thought, well, let's, do, let's start with a prophet, because you, your familiarity with Wendell Berry is probably not very extensive at this point. Um, Though, how many of you have read any, uh, other than what's a sign for this meeting, have read any of his, any of his novels? Yeah. Hannah Coulter, maybe? Yeah. yeah. It's, very, it's an excellent novel. Um, so I thought I'd start with the idea of a prophet, and I'll expand a bit uh, on what Will was saying. I, the, the category of a prophet, uh, of course, comes to us from the prophetic books of the Hebrew scriptures, um, and, um, and there are certain characteristics. One of the ones that, uh, that Will mentioned is that prophets um, are part of what they do, kind of the main, uh, their main job is to denounce the violations of a just order that they see around them. <clears throat> and that's one characteristic of a prophet that is, um, central to the biblical prophets, but also, you know, people apply more widely in ways that Will was discussing. Um, but there is also the idea that a prophet sees ahead, right? Foresees, um, <clears throat> and foresees especially the consequences of what we're doing now, right? That other people don't want to look at. And warns everyone, look, if you keep going the way you're going doing this, here's what's gonna happen and it's not gonna be pretty. So that's the second characteristic of a prophet. Uh, the third characteristic, certainly in the biblical context, and these, these all apply to Wendell Berry, uh, these, these three characteristics in, in various ways, the, the biblical prophets are moved to denounce injustice and warn about the consequences because of their receptivity to God's spirit. <clears throat> and they make these warnings in a voice that's shaped by their being embedded in the biblical tradition that, uh, that they're drawing upon to, um, to make that criticism. <clears throat> and then the most, uh, in, in terms of the, the, the prophets that we think of especially as uh, prophets with a capital P, in the biblically specific sense, the words of those prophets are so powerful and so deeply rooted in that tradition that they become themselves part of that tradition, right? So Ezekiel and Jeremiah uh, are scripture. Um, now, uh, that, that fourth characteristic, I you know, wouldn't necessarily want to apply to Wendell Berry, though I have been accused by some people of <laughs> doing that. <laughs> um, but, uh, but it's, I kind of turn that around and say, Wendell Berry speaking to us in our time can be an extraordinarily helpful voice for bringing us deeper into understanding what, uh, understanding some dimensions of the scriptural message that are not so evident to us maybe if we don't uh, hear what he has to say. 
So I'm going to kind of um, sketch out some ideas mainly from, or at least the, the, that, that begin to be really developed in a book that Wendell Berry published in 1977 called The Unsettling of America. And it's one of the best books about America that you could read. Um, it's the book that really established him. <clears throat> he was a fiction writer already before that, um, but this is a nonfiction book, uh, a look at agriculture, economics, and culture. And, um, and really established him as an important voice. And uh, an interesting thing about this book is that it was published by the Sierra Club. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Sierra Club, but it's an environmental uh, protection advocacy organization. It's worth knowing a few things about just to see the significance of, of their choosing to publish this book of berries. Uh, the Sierra Club was founded in 1892 to preserve wilderness areas in America. Uh, with the help of Teddy Roosevelt, Roosevelt, they established Yosemite National Park in 1905, and they supported very strongly the creation of the National Parks Service uh, as a body that would separate preservation efforts from resource management, which is where they had been located before. And, uh, and that's kind of important because, as you probably know, if preservation priorities and economic development priorities come into conflict under the same supervision, sooner or later the development priorities are going to win out. Right? Um, there's going to be some sense that, oh, now we really have to. Right? Uh, well, one of the things that, <laughs> that Sierra Club prevented from happening was building dams in the Grand Canyon. Um, so. The Sierra Club published this book by Wendell Berry, and the interesting thing about that is the, pretty much the very first thing that he says in The Unsettling of America is, you know, the Sierra Club's way of uh, approaching preservation and ecological problems is totally wrong. Right? And what's wrong about it is that they're so focused on wilderness. Right? And primarily, you know, to, to sort of sell preservation of wilderness, you focus on recreational activities. You can go and hike around in Yosemite, which is a very great, nice, wonderful thing. But that's not the core of the ecological crisis. The environmental crisis, according to Barry, is a crisis of using and living from the earth. And so it's fundamentally a crisis of our agricultural practices and our relationship to the sources of our food. The fundamental ecological question is how we should produce our food. And this is also a question of how we should live in relation to the land that produces our food. Right? This is the core of the ecological crisis, Barry argues. So that in itself, if you know anything about the history of environmental protection, is just a huge focus correction, at, like in the very first pages of the book. Uh, but Barry goes on then to kind of explode some very powerful myths about land use and, uh, and to make some deep connections between how we relate to the land and every other aspect of our lives. <clears throat> so the myths, what are the myths that Wendell Berry has to try to destroy here? Well. The big myths all surround the idea that large-scale agriculture is inevitable. <clears throat> that agribusiness will necessarily, through no fault of anyone's, replace the family farm as the way that we produce food. You probably are familiar with this idea. <clears throat> so uh, let's look a, a little bit at the difference between a family farm and a large agribusiness farm. A family farm traditionally grows one or two sizable but not enormous cash crops. And it also grows all kinds of subsistence crops and gardens and fruit trees and raises cattle and sheep and hogs and chickens, right? So it provides itself with fruits and vegetables, with meat, with milk, with butter, with eggs. And it grows everything that it feeds to the animals. So the family farm is mostly a closed circle of natural production assisted by human intelligence. The animals power the plow, the land feeds the animals, the animal waste fertilizes the land. 
and passing on the farm, usually at some point free from debt, which is an important point, uh, passing this along passes also a way of life that understands and respects the integrity of this closed circle. <clears throat> well, contrast with that the large-scale agricultural operation. It's specialized. It grows one or maybe two huge crops for cash. That's its primary purpose. And it feeds itself mostly from the grocery store. Although, you know, depending on who has time to garden, they may have a garden. Uh, but it's not sort of intrinsic to the idea of the, the large-scale farm. It's oriented primarily toward making money. It has no natural limits to its size. But it has to be at least large enough to make money to buy what the household needs. And usually to get that large, it requires going into debt at the outset. And so makes the farmers more concerned with money because they have to pay the debt in addition to supporting themselves. <clears throat> it also requires machines and petroleum to power those machines and buying those machines involves getting into more debt. Uh, and not only do you have to have petroleum to power the machines, but you have to have artificial fertilizer because you don't have animals, and that's made of petroleum. <laughs> so large-scale farming is in several ways dependent on petroleum. It's a huge inflow and outflow operation of cash and of materials rather than a way of life with the land. <clears throat> and the size, the scale of land in this large-scale agricultural operation <clears throat> destroys the sense of community with one's neighbors that, this, that a, a sort of town of small farms has, right? You can, if your farm is on a sort of family farming scale, uh, your neighbors are not going to be that too far away for you to walk and go say hi. Um, but if your farm is huge, it's going to be like, you know, 10 blocks in, uh, in city scale. <clears throat> uh, so it destroys the sense of community with one's neighbors who are engaged in a shared way of life. And if instead of growing, specializing in crops, you specialize in animals, which also involves a lot of debt, you end up with an additional difficulty of disposing of all the waste. Because you're not using all the waste to fertilize crops, so what are you going to do with it all? And, you know, no one wants to really pile up cow manure, you know, until you get a big enough pile of it to put in a big truck, and no one really wants to drive that truck anywhere. So uh, this is another problem. As Wendell Berry puts it, rather famously, uh, by separating animals and cropland, you turn a single good solution, using waste as fertilizer, into two big problems. How do you dispose of the waste, and how do you fertilize affordably? <clears throat> and instead of building up the soil as manure does, cheap chemical fertilizer is scientifically minimized to put just the chemicals needed into the soil to make the plants grow. <clears throat> and as a result of its not building up the soil, the soil is continually depleted. It's less fertile. It requires more fertilizer. And it erodes. So we have a runoff and <clears throat> chemical erosion from artificially fertilized crops, and we have useless manure piles, both significant environmental problems. Not to mention massive use of energy in tractors, transport trucks, fertilizer production, and commuting to see your neighbors or to the store, all of which were once walkable propositions. <clears throat> and on top of that, right, these are all dimensions of how a, a a, a functioning, interdependent, uh, sustainable community gets turned into a mess. Um, so in addition to that, as more work is done by machines and there are fewer kinds of work to be done by different members of the family, and there's a greater need for money in the household, this means that some members of the family are just going to go get jobs somewhere else. right? And so the family is going to produce less for itself, spend less time together, no longer share a way of life. <clears throat> and so we'll be less likely to pass on that life for several generations. <clears throat> because the children can always find a different way to make money, if that's the whole point. 
There may be a way that they're going to like better. <clears throat> so communities are destroyed. The relationship of the generations is weakened. Our thinking becomes more short-term. And we have less reason to be concerned about soil degradation, because if we're going to sell off the farm in a generation or two anyway, it's, it'll be someone else's problem. And the less involved we are in feeding ourselves, the less knowledgeable or concerned we are about where our food came from, how it was produced, and by whom, and under what conditions. So we care less about the whole human justice dimension of supplying ourselves with food. <laughs> so to kind of <laughs> sum all that up, uh, what we see here is a reverent and loving stewardship of the created world, which is handed down over generations, is transformed into a destructive and exploitative love of money that fails to reckon with future generations. It doesn't have many incentives to. And we call this progress. And in fact, progress is part of the whole myth-making language that hypnotizes us into a complacency about this self-destruction that we are engaged in. <clears throat> Along with other terms like science, technology, efficiency, productivity, mobility. Part of Barry's purpose and task is to expose these myths for the deceptions that they are. So let's take an example. Let's talk about efficiency, right? This is the big, this is the first thing you'll hear about these large-scale farming operations. So they're just more, much more efficient. And, um, and we're told that competition in a free market will inevitably drive agriculture to consolidate and specialize to produce higher yields at lower costs. And we can feel good about that because we have the satisfaction that we're producing more and feeding a hungry world. But Wendell Berry shows that this is really a myth. First of all, large farms did not arise from free market competition. Large farms arose from federal government policies. And the purpose of these policies, primary purpose, was to encourage overproduction of strategic food commodities achieved by subsidies and price guarantees. Why did it do this? It was part of the Cold War strategy. If we produce artificially cheap grain that we can sell or give away to other countries, we can diminish the appeal of communism in those countries. And that will help us prevent the spread of Soviet dominion and Chinese dominion uh, over the rest of the world. Now, you know, speaking as someone who lived through the Cold War, I, I'm really happy that we won. <laughs> and not just because I live in this country, but because I do firmly believe that we were on the right side of that conflict. Not that that would justify everything that we did in that conflict, but <clears throat> we're talking about a monstrously inhuman uh, sort of way of life and governance that we contributed in a very effective way to destroying, and that's a good thing. <clears throat> but uh, that kind of sense of emergency, and I don't know how well you can identify with that, but you know, there was the real, when I was a teenager, when I was you know, adolescent, pre-adolescent, there was the real sense of, wow, are, are we gonna be destroyed by nuclear weapons tomorrow or not, every day? Right. So there's a sense of emergency, and as I'm sure you know, <clears throat> that kind of sense of a looming security threat always can and eventually will be used to justify desperate and extreme measures of all kinds. And the domestic consequences of those measures will always be eclipsed by their supposed strategic importance. We know about that today in different ways, right? <clears throat> so in the context of uh, the early 70s especially, but you know, generation, uh, decades before that as well, the growth of large specialized farms, dependent on high yields, <clears throat> encouraged by government policies, destroyed towns and communities, and ultimately families, <clears throat> but ended up yielding enormous profits to agribusiness corporations like Archer, Archer Daniels Midland and other folks of that kind, uh, partly because they control the patents on those high yield, high resistance hybrid plants, and so <clears throat> right, I, I don't know how much you know about this, but if, you, if you're using those hybrid high yield plants, you can't like, save a certain portion of your crop and replant it the next year. You have to go back and buy your seed.
from the corporation every year. So that's part of how they make loads and loads of money off it. So, uh, so we can ask and we should ask, and Barry makes us ask, whether this situation of things right, resulting from a hypothetical foreign policy advantage <clears throat> was really worth destroying the land and the independence and social health of a way of life that loves and cares for the land and making people ever more dependent on the corporations that are made richer and more powerful in the process. And is there any good reason to keep doing that, <laughs> keep supporting that? We're still subsidizing in ways that are maintaining this system, though I can talk about ways in which it's starting to not work so well, if you like. Uh, efficiency. Is it efficient to constantly decrease the fertility of the soil and produce useless wastes? How efficient is a system that relies on cheap petroleum but ensures that the cheapness will not last by using it all up? How efficient can a system be if it relies on false accounting of the benefits and ignores most of the costs because they don't even fit into its economic model? <clears throat> Barry argues that it's not for us to fit nature into our economic model. It's for us to fit our livelihoods into nature's economic model. According to our model, which depends on growing production, fueled by growing consumption, fueled by growing debt. Economic justice and ecological justice are thought to be at odds because we can't increase production or grow the economy without using up more resources. But nature's model is not a model of limitless growth. Rather, it's a model of perpetual renewal within limits. Economic justice has to be just toward future generations, and so has to coincide with ecological justice. But, this is the last segment of the talking, but for a profit, that still isn't quite enough. Justice means paying what we owe, and ultimately we owe everything to our creator. Destruction of the created world and of the sustainable way of living in sustained families and communities that that created world makes possible for us is a form of ingratitude toward the creator. Can we love God if we do not love God's works and gifts? <clears throat> but Barry's quite clear that we're not going to get anywhere if we take that idea in as a kind of moralistic demand. Right? That is to say, you're supposed to love God, therefore you're supposed to love the earth, therefore you've got to preserve the earth. Right? And so this is kind of imposed on us as a, as a duty. Um, that may be a good way to indulge our sense of guilt and give us a sense of, well, I believe that whether I'm doing anything about it or not, but at least I believe it. And so I believe the right thing. And that's, that's something. Right? I'm judging by the right morals. Um, but then that also enables us to indulge a sense of helplessness, which gives us a pass on taking any responsibility and allows us to pity ourselves and be angry at them, the larger forces, about which allegedly we can't do anything. Right? Here's poor me. I'm a powerless victim with such good intentions, but, you know, so it is. Uh, well, I think all of you have read Augustine's Confessions. Well, no, you haven't. Probably haven't read it. Freshmen haven't read it yet. Um, but Augustine, uh, Augustine is, is sort of lured into a group called the Manichees who encourage precisely that sense, right? Here I am, you know, I'm, I'm not so good, but I'm helpless about it. It's, it's the universe that, that I'm trapped in, these larger forces. Uh, but this self indulgent position is precisely the one that Augustine was freed from by his conversion. So what, what, would con, what would conversion look like in this direction? Well, to find our way to the love of the Creator, <clears throat> we should begin with preserving the earth, caring for it, working with it. Working with the earth will lead us to love it, and loving it will already involve us in love of the Creator. We won't even have to try. Just ask Gregor Mendel. He knows all about that, if you could ask him, <laughs> right? He would tell you, every monk should garden. And Wendell Berry would ask, and so should everyone else. 
Um, this kind of activity brings us into contact with the beauty and goodness of God's creation and into relation with something real and enduring. So having said all that, I'm going to give you a bit of Wendell Berry's own way of putting this. This is his last novel, Andy Catlett, Early Travels. Uh, an old man looking back on his boyhood visits to his grandparents. And Andy Catlett is more or less Wendell Berry himself in these novels. <clears throat> so these are his grandparents he's talking about. Though the Feltner house was far more modern in its appliances than that of my Catlett grandparents, the same household economy of home production and diligent thrift prevailed there also. Everything that the place could provide, it did provide, and in abundance. Like Grandma Catlett, Granny Feltner still made her own lye soap for the washing of dishes and clothes. I think often now of that old economy, which was essentially the same from a farm household that was fairly well-to-do, like that of Granny and Granddaddy Feltner, to the household of Dick Watson and Aunt Sarah Jane, which would be classified as poor. For many years now, that way of living has been scorned. And over the last 40 or 50 years, it has nearly disappeared. Even so, there's nothing wrong with it. It was an economy directly founded on the land, on the power of the sun, on thrift and skill, and on the people's competence to take care of themselves. They had become dependent to some extent on manufactured goods, but as long as they stayed on their farms and made good use of the great knowledge that they possessed, they could have survived foreseeable calamities that their less resourceful descendants could not survive. Now that we have come to the end of the era of cheap petroleum, which fostered so great a forgetfulness, I see that we could have continued that thrifty old life fairly comfortably, could even have improved it. Now we will have to return to it, or to a life necessarily as careful, and we will do so only uncomfortably and with much distress. Increasingly over the last maybe 40 years, the thought has come to me that the old world in which our people lived by the work of their hands, close to weather and earth, plants and animals, was the true world. And that the new world of cheap energy and ever cheaper money, honored greed, and dreams of liberation from every restraint is mostly theater. This new world seems a jumble of scenery and props, never quite believable, an economy of fantasies and moods in which it is hard to remember either the timely world of nature or the eternal world of the prophets and poets. And I fear, I believe I know, that the doom of the older world I knew as a boy will finally afflict the new one that replaced it. The world I knew as a boy was flawed, surely, but it was substantial and authentic. The households of my grandparents seemed to breathe forth a sense of the real cost and worth of things. Whatever came, came by somebody's work. So, knowing something about Wendell Berry, hearing his voice a little, uh, assuming that we sense in him the presence of a prophet, what would that lead us to say makes a prophet? Probably something like this. A prophet is ultimately someone who cares deeply about what is true and good and beautiful and wants others to recognize how deeply they need to care about these things and finds the words capable of enabling them to see through the powerful delusions and idolatries that prevent them from caring sufficiently and enchant them into participating in the destruction of the right order of things. Augustine defines peace as the tranquility of order. The prophet is a lover of peace and therefore a lover of truth. Thanks.
And thank you for that, that was awesome. Um, so I think one of the things that I um, really took away from listening to that in the back of my head was the idea of, so, you know, it's not enough to just say, oh, like, these are my thoughts, and then, like, go well, along my day. The question is, what are we going to do about um, the ideas that are engaged by the prophet? A prophet isn't necessarily that effective unless there's going to be somebody there to carry out what the prophet is talking about. So the question is, you know, Wendell Berry put all of these thoughts out there, and that's wonderful, but how do we begin to engage them? So in talking about the seed to table movement, basically what we're talking about is one way in which um, Wendell Berry's thoughts have kind of taken root in um, a lifestyle and a practice that involves people in food currently. Um, when I'm talking about the seat to table movement, I am not an expert by any means. Um, I'm pulling from a little bit of experience that I've had working at um, Bethlehem Farm a couple weeks over the last couple years. I don't know if you guys remember Laura, she came in um, and played with some post-it notes at the end of last meeting. Uh, that was the organization she was from, so I'm gonna pull a lot of their philosophy from this um, and pretty much rip off some of their speeches um, with a couple tweaks here and there. So um, when I'm talking about the seat to table movement, I'm also talking about an organic style of seat to table movement that's not necessarily always like, you know, it's uh, squares and rectangles. Um, all squares are rectangles, not all rectangles are squares. Um, so when we talk about the seat to table movement, basically what we're talking about is being involved in the life of our food at every step in the process, from the time that it's planted as a seed to the time when it makes it to our table. And ensuring that this process is one that respects um, the integrity of the food and the integrity of those who eat the food. So we're working with nature and the relationship we have with nature to produce the food that we eat. Um, so I'm going to steal uh, a move out of uh, Dr. Shipman's playbook and also do a little myth busting. Um, a lot of what I'm going to say is really going to complement what he's already laid out because, again, this is kind of taking its roots in the thought of Wendell Berry. So the myth that we're looking at is we have the safest, most secure, and most productive food system in the history of the world. How do we know that that's not true? The first way is, Caitlin, if you don't mind grabbing that little thing behind you and sticking it on the wall, um, world hunger. In 2010, there were 925 million people hungry in the world. Um, so 578 million of those people um, were, for sub were from Asia and the Pacific. Um, 239 were from Sub-Saharan Africa, developing countries, um, but also 19 million were from developed countries. So across the board, we're talking about um, not being able to meet the demands of food. So obviously we must not be producing enough food, right? Well, not necessarily. It's kind of more that we're looking at insufficient um, and profit distribution, profit-driven distribution of the food that we have. The world produces enough food to feed everyone. World agriculture produces 17% more calories per person today than it did 30 years ago, despite the fact that there's a 70% population increase. So what this means is that there is enough food in the world to provide everyone with at least 2,720 calories per person per day, um, according to a study done um, in 2002. So the problem isn't that we don't have enough food, it's that people don't have um, access to the land or the income to purchase the food and distribute it in the way that it needs to. Also, we have food recalls. Um, if we're talking about the safety and sufficiency of the food industry, we have, um, can anybody think of any recent recalls? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, spinach. Um, that was a big one, 2006, anything else? Mm -hmm. um, there was also tomatoes in 2008, and as of September 17th, 17, um, as of September 17th, millions of pounds of beef from Canada's XL Foods have been recalled as well, but not before they were shipped into almost every state in the United States, um, in Walmarts, Costco's, Safeways, and Loblaws. The reason for the recall was suspected E. coli, and so while the plant is still um, out of commission, when they're going back into commission, the idea of how do we get this back in gear is that, oh, well, we'll um, 
pressure wash the sides of the beach with hot water. Problem, problem solved. Um, so along with that, cancer is more prevalent than it's ever been. 45% of women and 37% of men will get cancer in their lifetime. Birth defects are higher than ever, obesity is higher than ever, and health costs are higher than ever. So all of these things point to a broken food system. And I would suggest that the problem is that major food corporations, like Dr. Schiffman was saying, are trying to return a profit to their shareholders rather than producing fresh, local, healthy, delicious food for us, who are the eaters. For this reason, um, the Bethlehem farm model of seed to table farming is organic. So what do I mean when I say organic? Kevin, I got you this apple. I did it with Caitlin's help. She picked it. Got it right from the tree. Oh, great. So I'd like you to have it. Um, and you can go ahead and eat it. But before you do that. OK. Go, go to town. Yeah, go for it. It's fine. No, don't do that. <laughs> Um, so the idea behind that was that that's not necessarily that appealing of an idea. Um, <laughs> but, like Kevin seems to be fine with it. <laughs> um, but his first question was like, well, really? Um, so it's the idea that like, well, we actually spray chemicals on the majority of the food that we eat, but it's a little more, like, gives us pause when it's right in front of us when we see it happening. Uh, um, Um, so 95% of the food in stores is produced by the industrial food system, which uses chemical fertilizers, chemical pesticides, and chemical herbicides. Chemical fertilizers are produced using natural gas to pull nitrogen out of the air and into a chemical form that is readily available to plants. The problem is that chemical fertilizers in plants um, cause them to be absorbed too quickly, and the plants form more simple carbohydrates and more simple proteins which are easy for insects to digest. So insects will see chemically fertilized plants as food, which is unfortunate because we also want to see it as food and now we're in competition. So what does the industrial farmer do? Well, they spray them with um, toxic chemicals. The chemicals not only kill the pest insects though, they also kill all other insects, including bees, butterflies, and other beneficial insects that were eating the pests that were eating our food. Um, so now what? After spraying the chemical enough times, some of the pests become resistant to the chemical and they won't die. So now all of the beneficial insects are dead and you still have pests eating your food, um, which really sucks. So what do you do then? Spray a harsher chemical on the plants and the chemical cycle continues and now it's on our food and now we're eating it. In an organic system, um, we use organic fertilizers such as compost, uh, manure, leaf mold, soy meal, bone meal, grain sand, and cover crops to fertilize the garden. Crops absorb um, organic fertilizers more slowly, giving them time to develop a more complex carbohydrates and complex proteins that insects are less likely to see as food. So there's less pressure from the pests um, inside the organic system. And if a pest insect does become a problem, then you go ahead and just kind of pluck them off um, by hand. Um, so you also can encourage more beneficial insects to come in and eat those pests. And eventually, sometimes, um, you also lose a crop here and there, but you never put chemicals um, or poisons on the food. In addition to that, um, this model of farming also employs a no-till um, approach. So why do people till soil? To aerate the soil, to keep the weeds back, because their dad did it. Um, the problem is that tilling also destroys the soil. Soil is an ecosystem unto its own. So like when Dr. Schiffman was talking about the family farm being a closed loop itself, the soil works the same way. Um, the bacteria do, there's some bacteria that do really well in the first inch of topsoil. There's others that do really well a couple inches down and so on. And so you don't want to go mixing that up. There's networks of mycorrhizal fungal, fungi that run throughout the soil um, and that help fruits and vegetables get 10 times more nutrition um, from the soil than just their own roots alone. There's also earthworms throughout the soil, making networks of tunnel, allowing air down and water to seep up through capillary pressure. So when you till the soil, you set this all back to zero. 
Um, so at Bethlehem Farm, there is a no-till system. Uh, they haven't tilled the soil since they actually reverted the farm from a Catholic worker farm into their organization in 2006. Um, they let the earthworms aerate the soil. We use newspaper to cover the beds and keep the weeds down um, and let the soil work for us. Uh, when folks work in the garden, we can't even step on the soil. Uh, the idea is that your body weight compresses the soil too much. So if your body weight is too heavy for the soil and you can't step on the garden beds, think about what a tractor does when that comes through to till the soil. For that reason, um, everything's divided into beds where plants grow and pathways where people walk. So if that's kind of a little bit of the background of what thought process go, go into Seed to Table, um, I guess the upshot is, well, why Seed to Table anyway? And the first answer I would give is um, kind of along exactly what Dr. Schiffman was saying, like, dare I say, efficiency. Um, there's an efficiency in the seed to table uh, movement that recognizes and respects the resources that go into creating our food and the relationship that exists in between resources. Um, to, so to illustrate that, we wanted to compare um, a compost toilet with fertilizer production, along with a conventional sewage system with fertilizer production. So this is a small diagram, so I'm gonna have you guys um, help me illustrate this. So we're gonna look at the conventional sewage system with fertilizer production. Um, so some of you guys are wearing little name tags. When you hear your name tag, if you could just stand up. So in the conventional system, first we start with a fertilizer plant. Um, and then the fertilizer which contains a lot of harsh chemicals, is shipped to the farm via a fertilizer truck. Oh, yeah. Um, then there's a fertilizer tractor that's used to put the fertilizer onto the field, and then the nitrates run off into the water system, which is also someone. Um, from there, it's important to point out that the fertilizer plant draws energy from a power plant. Um, and then that power plant, in turn, is used to power not only a water treatment plant, but a pump house. In terms of getting the water and, and the um, sewage system aspect of things, the pump house takes water from Mountain Lake, pumps it to your house, um, and then you flush your toilet, and that goes to a water treatment plant. There, chlorine is added into the water, um, and some of that runs off into our natural water system. Um, from that, there is a sewage truck which takes the sludge and the heavy metals and dumps them into a landfill. Um, and that is how conventional sewer system works with fertilizer production to grow crops. Another option is um, through compost toilet production. So if our compost toilet person could stand up um, and show everybody what you need in order to fertilize your garden. <laughs> that's all there is to it, a closed a lot more efficient, not only in terms of the resource you guys can if you want, um, the resources, the time, the energy, but also the amount of um, like energy and waste that goes into each one of those steps and all of the transportation that's involved in it. Also, the idea behind seat to table, there's an aspect of responsibility. If knowledge is power, then with great power comes great responsibility. So knowing where our food comes from and being tied to where our food comes from makes us responsible to and responsible for those processes. When we don't see, when we don't know, we easily tolerate injustices because we don't feel tied to it, because we're not participants in it, so therefore we're not part of it. But in eating food and in taking something into our body, um, we're having that something become part of us. There is nothing more intimate than that. On the most literal of levels, we are part of it, whether we want to know it or not. So with seat to table, we're part of the process again, and we know what that process is, and we know ourselves within that process. And therefore, we begin to undertake that process more responsibly, not only in terms of what we administer or put into the process, but also in terms of what we feel we owe the different stages and the different resources in that process. We're physically connected to food again, and we acknowledge a certain dignity that this affords both us and the food. We also begin to understand the dignity and the responsibility it demands of us towards the food that is so intimately entwined with our very living. It's a lot like Old Yeller. 
As a sign of respect and a sign of intimacy, we don't ship our food off to be taken care of behind closed doors. We do it ourselves, because in some way it's us, and we honor it by being involved with it. So I wanted to give the example of um, chicken harvesting that happened at the farm at the end of the summer. Do you guys want to take a picture and pass? Um, the farm at Bethlehem Farm, they, um, put the, they got the chickens as chicks. They put them under a heat light. We raised them in the barn, and we taught them to eat slugs. We collected eggs from them, and we fed them twice daily. We closed them up at night. We turned them out in the morning. And when they stopped laying eggs, we slaughtered them ourselves for food. So the life of the animal and every part of the animal was respected and utilized. So there's one picture going around of um, the chickens in the cages, and I have another picture that actually involves the process. Of, um, and I thought for a second about whether I should show that or not, but I think the whole point is that it's important to know where our food comes from and to be engaged in that process. And so um, instead of being something that's gruesome, it's either something that we acknowledge, we participate in, and we feel a responsibility for, or we decide it's a practice that we don't feel comfortable with and decide not to engage in that process. But I think it's important to know what that process is and what that process looks like, because um, it's our way of being responsible with it. Finally, I think the biggest reason um, to kind of look into the seed to table movement is the idea of creativity. So when I was talking, thinking about this, I was thinking about the line from Ashland today that says, we're from dust into dust will return. Um, and that might sound like a little morbid thing to bring up, but I think it's actually quite the opposite. Um, and to unpack that, I wanted to turn to Adam. Adam, do you know what your name means? Uh, do you know what else it um, oh, suggested to me? Yes. Um, so the idea of Adam in Hebrew is earth creature. Um, the idea that uh, God created clay and shaped humanity into being. So life came from cultivating the earth. So our life is not only sustained by cultivating the earth, our life originated in cultivating the earth, according to this tradition, which I'm referring to because it's my tradition, um, and I studied it, so I feel like I can speak to it well. But this is a really common theme in a lot of traditions. Um, so God shaped us into being from earth. So when we garden, we're using our hands to shape something into being, to shape life into being with our very own hands. So we're drawing life forward through the cultivation of the earth. And in that process, we actually become co-creators with God. So we're participating in the divine, if you want to think of it that way. So in that sense, the idea of being tied to your food and so really cultivating your food becomes a holy act. You can see the interconnectedness of life, and you can't help but give it our respect. And we can see the sacredness of ourselves, of our food, and of creation itself, from which we ourselves our creature or our created, in which we help to continuously recreate. So we ask ourselves, what is it that we want to bring into being? What is it that we want to bring into the table? And that's basically the question at the heart of the food to table movement. Yeah. 
there's a <clears throat> there's a farm community that I spent a little time at up past the King of Prussia. That's a farm here. Um, and it's uh, it's what's called a biodynamic farm, which is to give a short character, it's organic plus it's strong. Um, <coughs> so it's a little bit interesting thing about it. But the the purpose, the reason this farm exists is, aside from farming, to be a, uh, a home for mentally handicapped adults who <coughs> work the farm, right? So you have several houses on a large farm property, it's a dairy farm. Uh, in the house you have a family, a few sort of single young people, and four or five mentally handicapped adults. <coughs>
what can we do to promote organic food besides just like growing your own tomatoes and stuff? I think that's probably something that I would invite you guys to explore how to answer um, individually for yourselves. I think it's whatever like makes you passionate. I know that um, this summer I did a lot more cooking, and so I was a lot more interested in my co workers with the being on the farm. Yes. 
stuff hundreds of miles. Uh, one of the reasons that it's cheap is because we as taxpayers are all subsidizing the highways. That is, we're like the, the, the big trucks that cause all the wear and tear on the highways are not primarily the ones paying for the upkeep of the highways. And, the, and if they were having to pay for it, then the producers would be having to pay for it because they would charge it for it, which means that the large farms would not be as artificially profitable as they want to make. So I think there's a lot of things like that that could change if you know, there were awareness that it's not only uh, a kind of social food supply issue, but there's certainly an issue of justice in itself. Um, I guess uh, I So if I was going to hopefully edit that, I would say um, two things. One, that I would probably shoot myself in the book the second thing I was going to say. Um, but the first thing was, I think one of the most interesting things for me that's going on right now is the ability to pack life. Um, especially uh, in the sea form, like Monsanto Cruz has a hedge and everything on the sea that um, is just like this added like, grower. And it like is transmitted. And so it finds its way into crops of a lot of local farmers or organic farmers. And then when they go to kind of like people with their produce comes up, they're going to be like, oh, that's, that's our DNA. Um, this is ours. And kind of like take that over and shut down, um, shut down those, those farms and those systems. Um, so I think that's something that's huge going on right now. Um, I know Genesis Farm, which is up in northern New Jersey, which may or may not be um, making an appearance with us this semester, um, they were part of a lawsuit um, with uh, about 100 other plaintiffs, I think, um, taking action against them and it was actually um, Google and keep down in favor of the large corporation. Um, so I think that's something really critical to be paying attention to right now. Um, and the other thing I would say is Really, um, I think the answer starts uh, with each person in their own local area because what um, what are the issues in one area? The structural issues to be engaged in one area are not necessarily going to be the same. Um, in other areas, different geographies and practices um, across the country, across the world, are going to be different um, different issues. I think informing ourselves, whether it's fracking, um, whether it's you know GMO sustainability of that life. Um, whether it's kind of like watershed issues, um, they, it, the ability to take action on that has to do with meaningfully engaging the, the political system as well. And so um, you guys are going to have the most power where you guys are as constituents. And so being informed about your local issues is going to be able to have, you guys are going to be able to have a stronger voice with your local representatives because they're the ones that have to listen to you. You know, what kind of weighing in on what's going on. Um, and in the end, it's not necessarily going to have the same kind of impact
business is a, a seed supply place, and he's been expanding their organic uh, dimension of it. And <coughs> I was talking to him about it. He said, you know, he, he, all the people who have the sort of small scale family organic farm were doing it because they think it's a great way to farm and they love it, um, have all stayed in business over the last decade or so. but. Several years ago, when the price of corn got so high, <coughs> uh, people in that kind of mid-range who were really a bit more interested in organic farming because of its profitability, you know, one day they said, well, I can make so much money planting every inch of my property with corn that I'm just going to do that and throw them on it and yield super amounts of corn and make lots of money. And, you know, that's something <laughs> Bring those into the next.